Hello and welcome back to the channel. Reading the first 3,000 penguins. This series is a lot of fun. It's giving me a thrilling challenge to read the very first 3,000 books published by Penguin. This is before the invention of the ISBN number and therefore these books are actually numbered all the way from 1 to 3,000. Um, my goal is to read the titles themselves, to read the books themselves, not the specifically first editions, but because some of these are out of print, it means that a part of my journey through reading the series is actually trying to find early editions um, or even first editions. And we're not doing them in order from one to 3,000, I'm doing them as and when I can get my hands on them. Quite a few of these are, you know, I had already read. So I'm also sort of working my way through books that I had read by revisiting them, sometimes rereading re them entirely, um, but in quite a few cases also reading books. Uh, for the first time, which is super exciting. Have you read any of these? What did you think of them? What do you think of these writers in general? How many of the 3,000 have you read? Please share it with me. I love to hear from you guys. One of them is number seven, uh, 25 by Beverly Nichols. I'd never heard of this, this book or this author um, before embarking on this series. And uh, I've been pleasantly surprised by, by some of the books that I'd never heard of and that are in fact very much out of print. This one is probably out of print too, and this author is long forgotten. Um, but this was not a book that wowed me and made me feel like this book should be back in print. Beverly Nichols, he was a kind of belletristic, social butterfly and commentator uh, on the sort of uh, literati and the intellectual and cultural elite of England in the early 20th century. And he also wrote novels. And there's a few of his books published in the, in the first 3000. Uh, this is actually a book of sketches or essays, but this is one of those instances in which the book is misleadingly described as a biography, 25. He starts off with this preface in which he says that this is a, a, a biography of his life, but it's nothing of the sort. We can't even really say that he meant that as a kind of uh, ironic um, sort of misdirection or something it's just it's just misleading marketing so sorry to Alan Lane you, you didn't quite get it right with this one um, this is not really anything about the author himself except a kind of showy eavesdropping gossipy recounting of very very famous people that he had met not many of them are of interest to us today um, he did meet W Somerset uh, Maugham and writes about him, but having after having read this um, collection of, 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 of sketches, of portraits, um, I sort of, some of it felt implausible to me and I, I did a bit of research and he was criticized by some of the people that he writes about saying, I don't know who this person is, like I've never met him and he's claiming that we're such good friends. And that's the one pattern that you see in this book is that wherever he supposedly is and, and with these eminent personages he's always at the center of even if he's not writing about himself he's always like in the inner circle so he even writes about like you know this kind of moth-eaten you know european aristocracy and and royalty he's with you know the the princess of greece or whatever but he's always it's like he'll describe this scene in which it was the king and the queen and the two darling princesses and me beverly nichols like why was he there it seems pretty dubious to me. So yeah, this is probably the first book that I have discussed on in this series that for me really fell quite flat. The only thing that saved it uh, is that he did have a very sort of fluid, playful style. Uh, so it, you don't get bogged down in his sort of inanities, like you, you can kind of breeze through it quite, quite quickly. So that's Beverly Nichols 25. Num and it's number seven. All right, next we're going to jump forward to number 300, which was George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. I actually discussed this very recently in my reading every Nobel Prize winner in that series. And George Bernard Shaw won the Nobel Prize in 1925. So because I've discussed this on my channel, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about it. I'm just going to take this wonderful opportunity to sort of say something that I missed out. <laughs> or in looking back that I'm not so pleased about with my analysis. And that is, I said, the central 
philosophical question of this book is to do with language and linguistic signifiers and how that sort of engenders our social standing. And that is true, but I wouldn't I would say there's a deeper philosophical level than that, which is much more one of ontology of being. How does our language shape our very identification with ourself, uh, with our being, with our psychological makeup? I think that is the even deeper question. Are we just linguistic assemblages? Are we just discursivities, as postmodernists would probably like to say? Or is there something more inherently humanistic, something deep, more deeply biological? That might seem like a very silly and false uh, dichotomy, but I think that we should be wary to dismiss linguistic um, dimensions of our contact with reality. We should not go to the full postmodernist extreme and say that, you know, it's a textual universe and everything is a play of signification and we never get to some deeper transcendental signified. That's extreme. But yet, we should also not go to the opposite extreme and say that, well, you know, language is just this vehicle, this tool that we use to sort of have this direct transit between our thoughts and our words or um, between our language and our contact with reality. It's much more entangled than that. Uh, language is very important. It does shape what we can and are able to think of. This is what Foucault talked about episteme or episteme, that uh, our very foundation of what is knowable is contingent on many discursivities on many realms of knowledge and learning that make up our understanding of the world. I've now gone so far off track, <laughs> but Pygmalion raises that question of how crucial is language to our, to the formation of ourselves. And then as a kind of ancillary byway from that, from that question, you know, how much can we change that and, and how much can we shape or manipulate uh, ourselves or somebody else's um, lingu linguistic uh, practices or boundaries uh, or their the way they speak and um, and what could that do to their fortunes, their outcomes, their position in life, in society. So that is kind of what Pygmalion does. It's about a, a very sort of bloodless or cold-blooded uh, linguist who decides to very... Um, unempathetically, very in a very cavalier, offhand way, grabs this, this, this very poor girl who's selling flowers on the streets and says, I'm going to, for the fun of it, for the sort of social experiment, I'm going to transform you into an upper class, um, you know, starlet. I'm going to transform you into a bell of the ball of the, you know, of, of the, I'm going to make you a social butterfly. And um, yeah, he does that. And yeah. As I said in my other video about this, this, this particular play, it shades a little too much into didactism. It's a little bit too much about conveying, in my personal opinion, conveying the ideas or the, the moral message, um, the sort of class criticism. It, 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 it leans a little too heavily into that as opposed to letting the complexities of the, the, the artistry of the story itself um, play out and then letting the reader or the audience member sort of navigate and find their own uh, moral message, you know. So it feels a little heavy-handed in, in that regard, but I'm going to move on now and talk about the next book. I've got Hemingway, To Have and Have Not. This is number 1065. In the first 3000, in, uh, I've got an old Panther mass market paperback. which have got a very choleric and alcoholic-looking sailor on the cover there this is one of um hemingway's sort of weaker novels um it's got a bit more of a pulpy feel to it a bit of a sort of action hero kind of novel um, when i came into reading this i my expectations were quite low there's been some quite famous criticisms of this book uh, notably uh, at least one that i am quite familiar with tony morrison's book playing in the dark she talks about the kind of uh, implicit racism of the characters in this book and how they're, they're kind of embedded into the story 
without being examined um, or challenged in any way. And that's a fair criticism. But yeah, it's, uh, it's about unpleasant characters, really. So it would be, it wouldn't make sense if this grouchy, sort of damaged, macho, tough guy persona suddenly uh, tried to, you know, change the, the, the racial dynamics of the world that he lived in it wouldn't fit so it deserves the criticism that it gets but if you keep your expectations low it's you know it's a, it's, a, it's an adventurous story it's got a high pace to it um, and it has a bit of a tenderness in terms of its romantic elements it has an element of pathos and a sense of a romantic fidelity which is quite touching but yeah it's a flawed novel as Toni Morrison pointed out and might even possibly, I don't think Hemingway is out of print, but if anything of Hemingway's were to go out of print, this would probably be one of the, the, the contenders to, to go out of print. Um, it's, it's not his best work, but if you want to have an opinion on it, then yeah, by all means read it. I can sort of safely place it in the lower reaches of Hemingway's oeuvre. Right, next I've got Camus, The Plague. This is number 1000. Number 1472, I've got this lovely Penguin Modern Classics edition. I've talked about Camus, and in fact, I'm going to talk about these two books of his, The, the Plague and The Outsider, or L'Etranger, The Stranger. But I've talked about them in more than one video, in at least a couple of videos. So I'm going to keep it quite brief here. I probably enjoy The Outsider, The Plague, and The First Man more than his philosophical treaties such as the myth of Sisyphus or some of his essays. So yeah, the plague is, uh, is, is a very fitting story for our times um, because, especially during COVID, because it is the story of a, a town in lockdown and how the inhabitants work together to survive this plague that is brought, carried into the town by rats. Um, it is I think the best, it is the better side of Camus' philosophy um, because it is about finding meaning through community and through selfless acts and the, the, the value that is generated by looking out for one another. And there's something very beautiful in that. And um, yeah, like much of his writing that involves the Algerian desert, uh, there is, I think, a kind of extended metaphor in the small hub of human activity in this case in the town of Oran and then the wide empty and inhospitable desert that surrounds it and that I think is this very rich extended metaphor for Camus about the kind of absurdity uh, of our place in the universe and how we need to make our own meaning uh, through caring for one another rather than searching for some transcendental meaning when clearly we are this small pocket of existence in this wide desert of space. Then L'Etranger, or The Outsider. This is number 1518. Also again in the lovely mint green penguin modern classics edition. This book has been talked about ad nauseum just in the wider culture, probably also on booktube. I've also mentioned it, so I'm really going to keep this as concise as possible. And we talked about, you know, the existentialism, uh, you know, of this book and about the sort of lack of meaning and the implications that that has for individuals and society. I'm going to just say something different about it. I'm going to talk about the voice of narration, the kind of supposed like plain style of narration. If you want to learn about writing good voice, this is a very interesting example because there is such um, detachment in the style of narration. I think the, the, the interesting lesson to learn in terms of literary craft is that you can actually, in a paradoxical way, create much more resonance and emphasis on the action of the events of the plot of a story 
by instead of very overheated prose with a lot of emphasis on description, you can actually strip that down. And of course, we just talked about Hemingway. He was a real master of this as well. Very understated prose style. Uh, and, and through that, you know, this, this sense of voice, this kind of uh, ambience of voice um, that you can actually give these events that form the plot and the narrative of your story a lot more sharpness and emphasis by having a more stripped down, neutral, uh, detached style or voice. And that I think is because of the, the contrast between the events. It, it really takes out the risk of sentimentality and being overly sentimental. Maybe some would argue that in, in The Outsider it's taken to the extreme. Obviously we know the famous opening of this book, My Mother Died Today, that famous first sentence. Or maybe yesterday, I don't know. Very, very much stripped of emotional fervor, but that only heightens, I think, the um, intensity of the, the content itself. Right, let's crack on of the last one, two, three, four, five. We've got four original penguins. So these are actually originals from the first 3000. I actually had all of these before I even thought of starting a YouTube channel, before I thought of making um, a series of reading the first 3000 penguins. So I did actually own these in the originals, which I think is really cool. This is number 2383. And this is John Berger, who is a, is a favorite of mine. John Berger's Success and Failure of Picasso. Um, I have actually also mentioned this book once on my channel. It's got some nice um, inset pictures of Picasso's work, all in black and white, unfortunately. And this is the first edition, yeah, which I didn't know. And I just sort of wrote all over it. It's a very interesting book. Um, it's early Berger. I think in his later work, he was more, or he had a, a stronger sense of authority. But in his earlier work, he was very overtly political. Which is nothing wrong with that. But I suppose he was trying to really show his politics in assessing Picasso. He, uh, so Picasso did have a brush in with socialism and, and Marxism through the artistic circles uh, of, of the French intellectuals. And um, so of course we have the, the very famous political work Guernica, but I think Berger tries to shoehorn that Marxist element a bit too much into this book. And I think later Berger probably wouldn't feel that, um, that need to, to, to sort of display his, his political leanings. Yeah, but beyond that criticism, it is a very interesting book. It talks about Picasso's sense of his own genius, that he, he was touted from such a young age as this protege, natural born genius, and all of the, the kind of mythology and self-mythologizing that comes with that. Talks about the history of Spain in a very interesting way, and the kind of um, outdated or almost medieval um, social economic structures of Spain and the influence that that had on the sort of context around the time that Picasso was growing up and his family, the fact that his father, his father was an art teacher and sort of was his early guide and was the one to see very quickly that this kid had an incredible gift for, uh, for, for painting. It then also talks about the sadness of Picasso's later life, how he was so rich and so famous while still alive, which is a very rare thing to happen to artists, to actually have that global adoration while you're still alive, often it happens after the artist has died. Picasso was very much alive, uh, but sort of trapped in this bubble of luxury and almost living in this kind of Disney-fied world in which his every whim was catered to. But then being an artist, he sort of lost his organic perceptive touch of, of the world because he was just in this, you know, this, this hyper sanitized and hyper convenient world of adoration and all of the kind of sycophants who, who surrounded him. The handlers, you know, he became a bit of like a global superstar. He could whip out, especially in his later work, he could just do these charcoal sketches of the, you know, of these nude models. And um, it would take him like 15 minutes to do one of these, but it would instantly be worth an obscene amount of money. So he quickly became 
the yeah the biggest collector of his own work and the more that he kept his own work in his in his in his villa in his chateau in his huge gallery uh he kept the more he kept his own work the more valuable it was so he became this kind of like monopolizer of his own fame which is quite disturbing and very interesting so then i've got number 2618 another first edition and this is an anthology south african writing today edited by nadine gordimer and lionel abrams uh nadine gordimer is is one of my favorite writers and uh, we did discuss one of her books uh, in the first 3000 okay there she is a world of strangers uh, was her first novel and that was also included in the first 3000 i love this so many great and underappreciated south african writers as you can probably hear i have a south african twang to my accent i was not born there but um, i have deep family roots there and i spent 20 years of my life in south africa um, so reading South African uh, writers is, is something that is always very pleasurable to me. And yeah, I'm just going to throw out some names here. So there are stories. The, the, the anthology is divided into three sections, uh, or four sections actually. There are stories, testimony, drama, and poems. Um, so we've got work here by Alex Laguma, Alan Payton, Jack Cope. Barney Simon, Casey Motsisi, Kantemba, Nadine Gordimer herself, Nathaniel Nakasa, Ruth First, Lawrence von der Post, Louis and Corsi, and many others. Um, I really, really enjoyed this. And yeah, uh, it just is such a beautiful evocation of the warmth of South African culture, but also the pain and the struggle. Um, to overthrow apartheid and this book was published really quite long before um, you know the, the the overthrow of apartheid so there was something quite relieving in a way to read this knowing that they were so deep in the struggle but that um, in time the uh, the overthrow of the racist regime would take place and the bravery of these writers is is so so commendable that some of them many of them were banned uh many of them spent time in solitary confinement and some of them just to think of ruth first for example she was actually assassinated um for being a part of the anti-apartheid struggle so highly recommend this it's very much out of print so it would be quite hard to get a hold of but um these individual writers uh, can can be found in various forms so absolutely love that definitely one of the, the the best books that i've read in the series so far next we've got paul gallico the snow goose this is number 2681 and yeah this is a book that i actually had again i had this book on my shelves before i conceived the idea of reading the first 3000 and so so enjoyable um it's this really slim volume of two stories the Snow Goose uh, is just this gorgeous, uh, lyrical, tender, and zephyr of a story about um, finding love in unexpected places and the, the warmth of human connection in lonely, desolate places. And it's also uh, now, I think, quite a, a famous war story. And then there's also the small miracle, which is um, quite a strange story of, of, a, of a small boy um from modern assisi in italy and he has a sick donkey and he wants um to get the, the blessing of the pope to visit the burial place of saint francis of assisi in order that saint francis might um heal his sick donkey so it's got a it's got a kind of fable quality to it it's like a tender and delicate tapestry of um of, of hope and innocence the snow goose yeah, this is also probably not that easy to find. It is probably out of print, but um, it's just a delightful little, little kind of wafer thin book, blazing summer day today. It, it feels like a like a sip of, of of iced water from some pure fountain stream on a hot day. 
Then, yeah, like these two are also originals, uh, 2816. This is Marshall McLuhan. The medium is the massage or the medium is the message. This is a really quirky, wild and eccentric book um, that was, I suppose, quite groundbreaking at the time about the influence of technology on uh, and, and progress and communication technology in particular on our um, society and sort of what that tells what that and, and sort of a prediction for the future it's got a kind of utopianness to it while also having um, quite grave warnings about you know misinterpreting the medium for the, um, you know, thinking that the message is separate from the medium, which it's not, you know, that when we read tweets or, you know, scroll through Instagram, um, we think we're consuming a particular media and it's just being delivered by this platform. But actually the platform very much shapes the, um, the message itself. And that is something that we should really be cognizant of in, in these times. So it's quite a prescient book. Um, but it does have a utopian element, um, but it's, it's quirky, it's a bit dated, but it's really a wild ride and, and a lot of fun. And again, I didn't even realize that this was a first edition um, and enjoyed looking through this again um, to make this video. Then I've got another John Berger. This is A Fortunate Man. This is number 2931, again, first edition. Um, and this is a book that he wrote in conjunction with a photographer, Jean Moore. And uh, this was a friend of his who's a, who's a photographer. And they sort of, yeah, it's a, strange, it's a really, really strange book. And Berger did have some, some quite qu quirky books. Um, sort of slightly genre-defying. This is a kind of long portrait of a country doctor going about his daily life, trying to, in his own small way, you know, reduce the suffering in the world and a kind of philosophical meditation on that small, brave, selfless sacrifice, but also how the doctor has to balance that sort of kindness and that sort of um, that net good. He's bringing a net good into the world. He, he's literally making the world better through reducing suffering, but that actually he needs to be as detached as possible because otherwise he's going to get too caught up in the emotions and the sentiments. So there's this, this difficult internal balance um, that the doctor goes through or that we uh, perceive in the doctor through the telling uh, in the words of Berger about how do I do my job as well as possible while being detached in order to do my job with concision and accuracy and scientific acumen. But how do I not lose then my human side? It's this kind of meditation on um, on how to function in the world, how to make the world a better place uh, in practical skills and a sort of interesting dichotomy between the, the function of a doctor and the role of a writer or artist and how dissection and how detachment and how analysis and how practical application, all of these things, the ways in which they diverge and converge in typical Berger fashion. And with these beautiful photos, um, by Jean Moore. I did find it to be at times a little condescending towards the, you know, the, the small town country folk uh, that's, that the doctor cares for. He is apart from them. He is sort of in a different class. He is educated uh, at university level and though he moves among them, he always remains apart and kind of um, bracketed off from them and that's some kind of friction there um, but it's it's well it's well teased out by Berger and yeah it's an interesting strange little book and very happy to to see that it was in the 3000 and I had it on my shelves already so I'm going to leave it there thank you so much for watching I uh, hope all of you are doing well have you read any of these um, what did you think of them what do you think of these writers in general? How many of the 3,000 have you read? Please share with me. I love to hear from you guys on all of these fronts. So until next time, thanks very much for watching.